Hello, lovely patrons, and welcome to yet another prestigious Pints episode with our old friend, Henrik Knieberg. So Henrik and I met at a conference a long time back. So for so long ago, we can't remember when it was, as, as you'll hear me and Henrik talk about there. But um, yeah, it's great to reintroduce um, and uh, revisit a, a relationship, a friendship from, from a scrum gatherings in the past. And Henrik's been around the scrum and agile scene for a long time. Um, since the early 2000s, formerly he wrote uh, Scrum and XP from the trenches, very much seen as the kind of the uh, an internal coach uh, doing Scrum on the ground, and kind of very much still a, a hands-on Scrum and Agile practitioner. So it's great to catch up with them. We talked all about his kind of history with Scrum and Agile, how he got started, the, some of the fabulous companies that he's worked for in Scandinavia. So it's great to hear some of those real case studies about what he's up to now and how he's being inspired to carry on that journey. So we hope you enjoy it. Um, we hope you're enjoying these prestigious Pints episodes. Um, and let's get on with it. Here we go. So hey, yeah, how are you doing? Hey, Henrik, nice to meet you. Yeah, the same. Uh, I know I've met Paul before. Uh, have we met? Um... Very, very briefly. I can't remember where it was, but it was in a hallway during one of the gatherings when oh. the, there was a WikiSpeed car somewhere. And, and oh, right. We were that both was... looking at it. And... I, was, I was way back. And what about Paul? I, I don't remember where we met, but I know we've met. Or I'm pretty sure we've, we've met. We've certainly met. We've certainly had, had a chat before. Again, probably at a conference or a gathering of some kind. It's probably. Just... Yeah. yeah, it was years. I'm talking years ago now, rather than uh, rather than months. Everything's years ago now, isn't it? Everything seems everything seems to have stopped for the for the last two years. <laughs> but yeah, it was probably a conference back in the day. So yeah, know. for the benefit of everybody else who can't see, Henrik is sitting in glorious, glorious sunshine in Stockholm. Uh, I'm back in my shed, <laughs> and, and Paul's in his in his office in his house. Yes. And it is um, raining here right now in, in yeah. beautiful England. Oh, it's raining, okay. so it's, it's glorious. Insane. I've been I've been indoors all day, so I'm like I have to get out. So I don't blame you. I don't blame. Beautiful blue skies behind you, Henrik. <laughs> so yes, we um, for 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 your benefit, Henrik, we, we 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 get in trouble if we don't tell our listeners what we're drinking because this is a pubcast okay. after all. all right. So um, today I, I'm going through a bit of a what's the what's the word I'm looking for here? Maybe maybe appearances. They say, you'd never judge a book by its cover, but appearances can be deceptive. All those kinds of metaphors and analogies. I've gone for something that I'm going to hold in front of me. Hold it in front there of it me. Is. What does it say? It's, uh, it's called... Beavertown. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but it's... Lucanaut? A Lucanaut or something. So um, it's it's something to do with outer space, I think, is the theme. There's lots of aliens on the camera. <laughs> but it's, ultimately, it's a lager in line. Um, which isn't something I would normally drink, but when I was younger and the sun was out, it was it was very much a summery drink for it's me. It's quite so a refreshing sort of, drink, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of a refreshing drink. It's only what four point four percent. So it's it was it has been sunny this week, although it's not particularly today. It's still quite warm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with it and uh, cheers. What have you got, Paul? Well, I've got um, it, as a tribute to you, Henrik. I've gone for a Swedish cider. Now these are very big in the UK, which is Copperberg. Okay, what kind of cider? So this is uh, it's alcohol free because uh, I'm, 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 no yeah apple looks like apples or... it is apple apple and raspberry it's kind of a mixed fruit Ooh. edition but uh, copperberg made in Sweden I feel um, I feel very bland now I'm gonna go get a Coke Zero because that's about all I got at home but, <laughs> <laughs> but is is copperberg a, a thing in Sweden Henry oh, yeah, or, or not yeah, it is it is is it an export that your country's rightly proud of. Uh, that, that that's actually a good question i i don't know really uh how proud we are of it but <laughs> but it, it is a it is a pretty big thing i think it seems quite crazy for england to be importing cider considering it's one of our major yeah, products exactly. as well. but we recorded it as well there's another one isn't it that, that comes from sweden is that uh, yeah that's swedish as well isn't it i think yeah. yeah and we see that a lot here as well so it's obviously uh it's obviously doing well if it's if it's um penetrating the the uk uh, market definitely 
so yeah thanks for joining us it's been um it's been good to get you on uh, or it is good to get you on for um, i mean everyone will know who you are that's one of the reasons why we've invited you on because you've been an inspiration to so many people in the agile space um but if i give a very brief recollection of my well my recollection of your journey i suppose <laughs> so the first the first time i came across you was with the trenches books right uh, which which didn't even start out as books right they, they 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 started off as was it lean pub yeah well yeah it was it was an article that kind of went out of control yeah um <laughs> and then ended up in lean pub i guess an emergent book yeah definitely it was not planned and then i'm not quite sure which way around it was but there was then there was the whole spotify thing and the product ownership in a nutshell which kind of went viral mm. yeah that, that youtube video um and then because we were at the same sort of conferences and things i'd often see you with your son because you went through a time where you were tr taking your son everywhere right you were just living the dream of just traveling with your family and well yeah i have i have four kids so there was always one or two that were interested in joining on a trip so I would, they would kind of take turns you taught csm classes with them as well i think didn't you uh yeah sometimes but like when i when i was traveling i would bring like it's actually it, they, was, they thought it was quite fun being in classroom settings actually it's because there's there's whiteboards and there's pens and there's flip charts and stickies and, <laughs> yeah. and lots of snacks and so <laughs> yes uh, and I, mean, I I not to that degree I, I looked upon that with with a with a certain degree of envy because you know that would have been sort of my living the dream if you like but I did I have managed to take some of some of my kids to some of uh, some of our things um, and you know getting the Lego out and sitting with the class and enjoying things so they absolutely love it and the class yeah, love it as well but... I, I, I bet they're like dad is this really your work are you getting paid for this absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah 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 so have I, uh, is that sort of chronologically correct more or less yeah and is there anything glaring that that I, I've missed uh, I did some work on climate change um, and I guess I did a bit of a pivot, like back into now I'm back into into coding and design. Mm -hmm. So it's been a been a bit bit of back and forth. But I guess if there are some highlights in terms of stuff being known, I guess there's probably those are probably the main ones. Okay. Yeah. And obviously, yeah. I haven't mentioned anything about the backgrounds. So I'll leave that to you, Paul, because uh, <laughs> you're a fanboy moment. When I, I yeah, so my son, I've got a, a nine year old son, Henrik, and. Um, he was beside himself when I was telling that, t telling him that I'd be speaking to someone who works with Minecraft, who works at the company that, that <laughs> um, g generates the Minecraft game. And he gave me, he must have reeled off about six or seven questions. I said, well, what, what would you ask someone like that, Owen, if you, if you could speak to them? And, he, and, he just, and it, then he went to some, some kind of different language that I just didn't understand of all these different Minecraft-based questions, yeah. Um, and he was so excitable. But you said, because you said about your kids and, and you must, because you've worked at Lego as well, right? Yeah. Um, so, but you've, your kids must be, they must think you have the coolest job in the world, surely. Uh, yeah, they're kind of like, how am I going to, I want I want a job like that when I grow up. How do I do that? <laughs> they're they're kind of pre prematurely jealous. Yes. <laughs> I want a job how, like that when I grow up, to be honest. Yeah, I think we all do. Yeah. How, how did you get, get stumble into those positions? And I know you're still very much a coach consultant, but how did you, you know, happen across those companies? Yeah, it's it's a bit weird. Um, I guess there was one period just before Spotify when I realized that I was just being tugged around in different directions. Yeah. Because it's always easier to say yes than no. Um, so I realized I was traveling around a lot doing, you know, various consulting gigs and talks, which I enjoyed, but I felt completely unfocused. And then I did this kind of self-coaching thing where I started listing down what would be my ideal work situation, ideal client. And I wrote down like a kind of vision, like this is what I would like to do. And then to my surprise, I realized that if that client calls me today, I'm going to have to say no because I won't have capacity for it, Yeah, which would be stupid. So that's when I decided to kind of take a break and, you know, clear my calendar a little bit, try to be a little bit more deliberate about what I spent time doing. So, so I took a break. I spent, went traveling six, six months with my, with my family um, uh, and then came back kind of fresh with an empty calendar. And, that, and that's when I contacted Spotify because I'd worked a little bit with them in the past. Um, but then I was like, actually, Spotify kind of ticked all the boxes in terms of what I want to do. Yeah. I basically just did, uh, you know, my, my first and last cold call, sales cold call. I hate sales. It's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> but I kind of call, called a, a guy that I, that, that I knew there, one of the middle managers, and basically said, hey, you know, you, you guys have growth pain, right? And he's like, yeah. 
and I said, do you want help with that? And he said, mm -hmm. yes. And then we had a lunch and it was done. So really? that's pretty kind of what happened. And then, and then I got stuck there because it was just, I was learning so much and they needed help and, um, and, and they grew and yeah, so I was there for, for, for quite a long time. But then l later on when I kind of felt the need to move on, then I guess, uh, Lego contacted me because some of those people had seen my books and stuff on Spotify. Yes. Uh, and then I was kind of like Lego. I can't say no to Lego. My kids would you know, like <laughs> They'd disown them. you, wouldn't they? <laughs> so I had to go to Denmark on a regular basis. Um, and it was really interesting. Um, but then, uh, and then I had a climate panic attack at, at some point, I realized that shit, the climate is going to hell. The climate is going to hell. Is there anything I can do? So I started, you know, becoming a climate nerd and climate entrepreneur, starting companies and spreading knowledge and making videos, just like, hey, you guys, we gotta, you know, <laughs> we we need this atmosphere, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Not not much of a future without it. So I did that for a while, and then I, I was planning to continue with that, but then I kind of stumbled into Mojang because I had a colleague work, working there, and I realized after all that, although I, I climate change is the most important problem in the world, I felt that I, it wasn't my calling to work with. Um, it was I was torn between what I should do and what I want to do, and what what I wanted to do was just, well, actually code Minecraft. Uh, I stumbled into the team there and started helping them with stuff, and finally I was like, hey, shit, I'm doing design and coding now. Now I'm apparently part of this design team, and this is fun. This is what I want to do. <laughs> so it became this kind of realization that what I actually want to do is not primarily coaching and doing talks, although I like that, you know, to a limited extent. Yeah. What I actually like to do is build stuff and work in teams and have my hands in the code and, you yeah. know, design. That, that's actually my calling in life. I kind of realized a bit late. So that's, yeah, so I kind of oriented my life around around doing that. So I still do coaching and stuff, but but mostly in the context of my current engagement, like coaching the teams around me and the leaders around me. Yeah. yeah. And a few, a few things outside. Yeah. And I think no, um, that's the, when me and Jeff were talking about the various people that we wanted to speak to as part of these, Henrik, when your name came up, <clears throat> those the words that resonated with me with with you were, were that you're actually doing it and you are still very much at the coal face in terms of a lot of um the agile talks and the, the videos the content that you produce is all it's high integrity stuff because you're doing it you're actually living and breathing development on a daily yeah, basis just, just, and, sharing, sharing personal experiences basically yeah and exactly, i think that's exactly what um we still need to hear those those compelling stories and 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 to motivate people towards doing this on a better on a day by day basis, but um, to go back to this, you said you back all the way back to Spotify. I had a brief look at your LinkedIn profile, and you, and you, you quote you, you've written yourself. You think you've accidentally created it uh, that the Spotify model or co-created the, the Spotify yeah. model. Can you talk talk to us about how that came about? It was a, it was the weirdest thing ever. Um, I was there for a few for like uh, quite a few years actually, but after maybe two or three years there, I was like. This is interesting. This is an interesting company. It's different from other companies I've been at. And we were growing quite quickly. And I realized that the culture seems to be there's something magical here. And it, it can easily be lost as new people come pouring in. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I started becoming the guy that would, you know, introduce new newcomers to what is Spotify about? What is what are we trying to be? Um, and uh, then at some point, uh, I was going to do a talk at a conference in Paris, I think. And then I, I, I su suggested that as a topic because I thought there's things here we can learn. So I did this keynote in Paris and it went completely viral. Everyone was talking about, I don't think they used the term Spotify model at the time, but I just noticed that people were ex extremely engaged in it. So I realized, yeah. oh, it's not, it's not just me. There's others who think there's interesting stuff happening here. Um, and I started getting a lot of requests to do more talks around it, but also internally a lot of more, more requests. So finally someone suggested that, hey, Maybe you should make a video instead of just you talking all the time. You know, make it, it'll scale better if you just put it, put it down in a video. So, so I did that. I made a video out of it. I figured that great. Now I can just put out the video and I don't have to re keep to redoing the talk, <laughs> which of course had the exact opposite effect. So, Spotify. What I didn't expect was when I put that video out there, I, I didn't expect it to become a, like a a model, which you know hundreds of companies would use as their kind of framework. That was a big surprise. So how big was Spotify at that kind of time when you were just starting those those talks? Um, probably maybe, I would guess, two, three hundred people or something like that. OK, um, so this is pretty much at the start of their journey then. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a startup. So when it started, they were just a, you know, a, a small group in a basement, basically. But 
But when I started working with Spotify, I think maybe there were 30, 40 people. Oh, okay. And then when I started working more almost full time, or at least, yeah, um, like more regularly, then maybe there were, you know, 200 or so. Uh, and, that, and that's when I noticed that this, there's something here that I want to capture. There's something interesting happening here. I, it's been very useful, but I, I can absolutely empathize with, well, I'm, I'm assuming here, but I, I think I've picked up, not just from you, but from many other people, a, a sense of frustration that people have taken that Spotify model out of context. Um, because what people are quoting as the Spotify model never existed. It's not something to be copied, and yet that's what people do. Um, now, <clears throat> it's done a lot of good. So I'm wondering, from, from your perspective, looking at that, what's the sort of mixture of feelings? Is there pride in there and frustration? Or, or what's in there when you look at what's going on with it? Um, for me, it's mostly, I think, curiosity. Um, I don't have any frustration anywhere, actually. Uh, I know that some other people are kind of like, hey, you shouldn't just copy a model and blah, blah. But my experience is, is that people copy models all the time, copy other companies and learn from it and improve. And that's kind of the way things work. Uh, most of the ideas that we applied at Spotify weren't invented at Spotify. That was just us looking around and stealing the best ideas from everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that's both natural and even good to copy from each other. Um, the most important thing is, of course, to adapt. You can't just copy and then not adapt. But I don't. I haven't seen anybody just copy any model and not adapt. You, you mm -hmm. kind of automatically have to do that. So I'm really not uh, worried about it. Um, and I find that I've met a lot of companies who uh, apply what they think of as a Spotify model. Mm -hmm. And what I've observed is that in most places, in most cases, they end up in a better place than they were before. Yeah. Yeah. They don't end up, you know, doing the same thing as we did. And that what probably wasn't even appropriate. But they got inspired. They 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 they, they took some ideas. Uh, and imp implemented their interpretation of our ideas or sometimes even their misinterpretation of our ideas and it doesn't matter uh, they got inspired to change and they changed uh, so that's fine um, and it also seems like there's a lot more to win than to lose because I haven't seen a single case firsthand where things got worse mm, yeah um, so that's why I'm not really worried about it I'll just say go ahead you know, co copy paste and adapt from all over would the place would it have been any different if it was called the Henrik model <laughs> or, the, or the Newberg model rather than Spotify yeah, then, then I'd be more worried I'd be like what the heck why, <laughs> <'Cause> am I <laughs> not responsible for how, what, where you end up like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are, the, are, the people, are the people at Spotify how do they feel about it so it's kind of interesting um, in the beginning when it first was released um, that was the time when it was most accurate of course mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, or like the, like the, the video at the time was pretty close to reality, and then of course over time the video stays and reality can changes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 the the, the correctness of the, of the video de degrades over time. But at the time when it was released, most people were like me; they were just very surprised because they're like, "What? Why is everyone talking about something called the Spotify model? What is that?" Mm -hmm. Someone says, "Maybe we should try it." That, that, that's what you guys are doing. What? I've never heard of it. <laughs> and then someone points at the video. Oh, that. Oh, oh, that's a model now, and it was like, <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, but then I, and, and, but mostly people were very happy because um, the most common comment internally was uh, um, spot on, like this nail is what we are or trying to be, and then that became a really useful recruiting tool because mm -hmm. a lot of people saw this video, came to Spotify already primed, so yeah. we didn't have to explain what we want to be. They already came knowing that. But of course, you know, five years later people would watch a video and coming expecting to see that and then they'd be very surprised that it's, things are different so mm -hmm. in that sense I guess it, it kind of became frustrating they had to explain that this video was a snapshot in time for a company that was 10 times smaller <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. and are you still working with them now Henrik or not um, no I'm, I'm almost f f full time at, at Mojang now okay are the, what, what are the similarities and differences be between the two um, similarity I guess is a very experimental mindset and a very pragmatic approach to agile, you know, very little buzzwords and dogma, mm. um, and a, an extreme passion for the product. I think is a is a is a common denominator. Also at Lego, people just care a lot, yeah, um, which makes things both easier and harder sometimes. Well, they're all three those three companies. They're all really easy products to love. I think, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah de definitely. I worked with some banks before and things like that. It's a little harder sometimes to find the same level of engagement. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. But uh, so that's, I guess, a common denominator. But there are some differences too, I guess. Um, um, so I guess the scale is a difference. Spotify was just so much bigger. The, the Minecraft team is quite small, very small in comparison. Um, although Mojang is a bigger company, but I work mostly with the Minecraft folks. Um, I guess another difference is that um, um, at, at Spotify, there was also more things happening. There was hardware. There was like 
partnerships and integrations, like it was a more complex ecosystem in a sense. Mm -hmm. Minecraft is more of a coherent product. This is the code base. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, Spotify was a, was a more like a you know um, microservice architecture with a thousand you know hundreds of different systems and interact in different complex ways. Plus, that Spotify was very much around operations. It's a system that's running. People need to press play and music needs to start. Yeah. Uh, Minecraft, sure, we do run servers, but mainly it's a product that we ship and people download and run on their own, host their own servers. Mm. So we're not as much, you know, like having to host and, and do that kind of stuff. So going back a bit further, uh, Henrik, back to kind of, well, pre almost pre um, Scrum and Agile, that kind of the, the movement first started. How did you first get involved with kind of software development and how did you that steer you towards ag Agile as a, as a wider concept? I guess like most things, it was also accidental. Um, <laughs> but when I started as a software engineer, um, I was a consultant. It was This was during the dot-com era. So any okay. person halfway through college was considered an expert. Yeah and would be paid large amounts of money to consult or contract to type, write code, even though we're all beginners. <laughs> Crazy period. So there I was, consulting, contracting, writing code. Um, but I was kind of surprised because I, I, I'd be sitting there in my, in, my, in my cubicle, you know, typing code a and then part-time as I was also studying. And I noticed that, you know, I didn't even know who the customer was. I didn't know, didn't know who else was working on this thing or how my stuff was supposed to fit together with anyone else's. And it became this pattern of, it almost felt like I was in, you know, like a matrix moment. What is this weird parallel universe where people are just working and nothing fits together? Is this really the way it's supposed to be? So I was almost kind of disillusioned. Like, is this really, you know, the way it's supposed to work? Do I really want to be in this business? Like, it just, <laughs> so I just saw so many f big failures. Uh, but then later on, a, a friend pulled me into a startup and it was just f us four starting a company. And, it, you know, and I, so suddenly I was writing code for myself. Okay. And I was hiring people and I was building teams and I was like, shit, uh, n now I need to make this work. Uh, now i got a bunch of people and I need some way of working. And uh, I don't want it to be like all these failed projects I've seen. Mm -hmm. It's like I knew exactly how to fail, but not really how to succeed. Yeah. Um, so I was like basically desperately looking around for, you know, there must be some IT projects that succeeded somewhere <laughs> that I can learn from. <laughs> and I started kind of desperately Googling around and I ended up at this C2 or C3 wiki. What's it called? Uh, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham and company. Okay, yeah. Uh, their initial, the first wiki basically, because Ward Cunningham invented wikis. That's right. So that, yeah, that we forget the, that. We that do forget that. Wiki. Yeah. Um, and then uh, that well, that was just. It's still up. You can still find it. It's full of wisdom. They're basically yeah. sharing knowledge. So things like pair programming, test driven development, you know, self organizing teams, all that. Before Agile came along as a concept, that's the this kind of what, late nineties, yeah. Yeah. So I was, yeah, I was in the. I think I was ninety nine or something like that. I was, I was uh, using that site to learn. Uh, maybe 2000 and uh, I started applying what was on the site because it seemed to just make sense and it kind of worked like it wasn't like silver bullet of course but compared to absolute guaranteed disaster it was great right we were shipping stuff we were having fun yeah we were learning and iterating so I was like okay this seems to be a better approach so I was basically hooked from day one mm -hmm. um, and then later on Agile Manifesto came along and kind of like it became more clear like and I, I just stayed with it since then basically so, so along the way, who, yeah. who, who stands out for people that you look back and think, you know, what they did or what they wrote or what they said, either consciously or, or, or subconsciously, they were influences on you and your career? I would say during different periods, it's been different people, but I would say it kind of started with probably Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries and, uh, you know, Ward Cunningham, the XP guys, basically. Mm -hmm. And then later on, as I started applying this at scale, then I stumbled into Scrum and I started working with, with Jeff Sutherland. Mm -hmm. And... Then he became a big source of inspiration, basically because we worked a lot together. Yeah. And then uh, uh, later on, I got into lean. I started getting more curious about the whole, you know, why does this work? What is the what is the, what are the principles behind, which led me to lean and systems thinking. So then I started working with Mary Poppendick and people like Don Reinertsen and that whole kind of lean side of things. Um, so it's been different during different periods. Um, basically trying to you know learn from as many people as as I can. Hmm. And you mentioned Henrik. So the companies that you talked about largely and. You're based in Sweden, um, just outside of Stockholm, you, you mentioned. But do you see, is that mainly your clients and, and the companies you've, you've centered around that kind of uh, location geographically? Have you ventured much out into the rest of the world? Uh, I've been traveling quite a lot to do conferences and courses, but not so much for coaching, basically because I'm lazy and <laughs> I have kids and family and I don't want to do engagements where I have to travel regularly. 
So basically, as long as I could find interesting, you know, clients in, in, in nearby, I would, I would prioritize yeah. them. And I mean, I lucky wouldn't... Stockholm has been a kind of a bit of a hub for interesting companies. Well, um, that's the thing, because Scandinavia certainly is, um, certainly from looking from here from the UK, we've we've looked at uh, Scandinavia as kind of a very much a hotbed of, of agile in terms of early adoption and kind of a lot of companies that have, have really taken to it. Do you, th do you think that's, um, have you noticed that with Scandinavi Scandinavian yeah. companies as well? Def definitely. And I, and I think there's a bit of a cultural bias that's helped us because a lot of these values in agile, such as the self-organization and stuff, kind of fits with Swedish culture. Okay. I think maybe, I'm just guessing, but maybe that's why there's a little, maybe a little bit of less resistance since people kind of tend to want to work this way anyway. Yeah, that's part of it. But otherwise, I don't know. There's always been a lot of, you know, companies starting around here, um, like a pretty entrepreneur friendly culture. I'm not sure why. Maybe part of it is also our, our social security system, where if you would decide to start a company, you're not risking your livelihood. Mm. Um, so it's like a limited liability thing um, and uh, kind of insurance. You're, 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 you're not going to be homeless and hungry if you fail. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes people gives people a bit of courage to, to try things. Plus, I think the the free education, anyone can go to un university, and at universities, without paying. So so without, so so that mean and there that's where people meet each other and get ideas and want to try new ideas. So I think maybe just the fact that there's so many people that have the economic opportunity to try crazy ideas means that there's statistic likely that some are gonna some are gonna succeed. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely that I get that. Um, we hear a lot in the news about again the social security system particularly in Sweden about how people um, generally happier and kind of they feel a lot more I think it's a lot to do with psychological safety as well people feel yeah. like they they like you say try things out they can perhaps change their job or they can uh, start a new company or, or come up with a new idea without a fear of failure without yeah. without you know, I guess the, the downside is if you do succeed and you you know your company does well you get rich you're gonna be taxed a lot for it exactly yeah you're not gonna yeah. get as filthy rich as you might have been somewhere else yeah uh, but yeah but you, yeah kind of <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather pay high taxes and have you know an increased social security? Maybe that that's the thing. That's a that's yeah. a cultural difference. Yeah, I find but, that once you you know when it comes to like w once you get past a certain level of earning money, I think in most cases that extra doesn't matter so much. Mm. When you have your basic security and you can do what you want to do, then it's the rest is maybe just. I know that some people are very driven by earning as much money as possible, but I think it maybe just becomes a game a a after some point. Yeah. Uh, so m most of the people that I work with. You know, entrepreneurs—they're not driven by "I'm going to get rich." It's more like, "I want to do this thing. I want to change the music industry. Uh, I want to make a wonderful game." And then the the money is more like the rocket fuel. You need fuel for the rocket to go, but the fuel isn't the goal itself, um, kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I, I, this is a very, really oh, probably a really silly thing to say, but uh, from a stereotypical perspective. And when I think of Sweden, I think it's a happy country. Yeah. And that's a real generalization to say, but I think of Sweden as a happy country. Depends on what time of year you come. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, quite probably. But yeah. I think in general. Yeah, no, that, that, that's true. There, there are, from, from what I've seen, also statistically, I mean, not at the top, of course, but definitely it seems to be kind of above average, generally, general well being. Um, yeah. And I think that helps with regards to. Because you need a lot of resilience for entrepreneurial startup type businesses, yeah. as well yeah, as having that safety net and the psychological. If you're safety. super depressed and super worried about how you're going to pay this month's bill, mm. you're not going to be likely to start the next Spotify kind of no. thing. No. no. Yeah, true. How you said, um, Henrik, you like traveling. How has this last uh, 18 months affected your travel schedule? Uh, other than just um, no travel at all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How, how have you been coping with I that? I have this. Uh, I have this dilemma because I like traveling, but I also don't like climate change. Yes. And flying is a problem. Mm. So at some point, I realized I can't sit on a plane anymore without feeling like sh like shit. Mm. Um, so I, I minimized that radically. Uh, so that was one. So I did travel a little bit, but mostly by train whenever possible. And I went. I would get on a plane sometimes, but just like a last resort. Uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, COVID came along and the last little bit of time I was doing um, for a long time. Now with COVID ends, I don't know. I'm kind of still hoping for, you know, travel more locally. Training, I think, is nice. It just takes time. Um, it's not super reliable. But uh, what I really want is for someone to just invent the damn electric plane. Hurry up, man. Make the electric plane so I can go back to traveling all over the world. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything's possible, isn't it? Well, I mean, maybe that's it? maybe that's yeah. your maybe that's your calling, Henry. 
it, it, it kind of is. I, I just I just don't think I'm going to be the one inventing it. So I'm just going to keep uh, inspiring people, hoping hoping so. Well, there's also plenty of people doing it. So it's just a matter of fanning the flames, right? H hurry up that that innovation. Yeah. Yeah. So we've um, we've asked pretty much everyone that we've spoken to on these types of episodes how they've seen things change over their time in the industry. We're getting some breakup. Yeah, is that me? No, I think it's you. I think it's Henrik. We get some um, these signals dropping. I think Henry Henrik a bit. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, yeah. I didn't move to shade. I think my computer's overheating. It's getting angry at me. Yeah, it was just it broke up that last few yeah. minutes. There we go. Um, you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I think I can actually hear the fan on your machine as well. But <laughs> that's, that's good. I'm freezing up, I'm like, okay, this computer's overheating. It was written in direct sunlight. <laughs> I was just saying that we've um, everyone we've spoken to on these these types of episodes, we've asked them how they've seen things, generally in the agile space, change over their time in 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 the in the industry. What what would you say the major changes that you've seen are, and how is the state of things right now from your perspective? Um, I, I think maybe the main trend I've seen is. Uh, uh, going from dogma to being pragmatic. In the past, it was a lot more like, hey, my framework is better than yours. Or, hey, you need to use this framework by the book, otherwise you're doing it wrong. I don't see a lot of that anymore. Um, and also, there's a lot more uh, agile is taken for granted kind of thing. Before, you'd have to kind of explain what agile is, and there'd be a transitioning, and there'd be like almost like a convincing happening where people needed to be sold what agile is. I don't see that anymore, at least not from my perspective. It's more like people want this. They, they want help with the how. Mm. Um, so, I, of course, you know, every, my perspective is, of course, biased by the companies I happen to work with. But at least, the, yeah, I've, I, I've, I've seen that, that trend pretty clearly. Mm. What do about you, you think? Uh, well, well, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I'll come back to my question. I was going to change the subject. Uh, no, on, the, on, the, on the whole dogma side of things, I, I've been slightly torn on that over the years because um, I think there is an element of people tailoring things and diluting things a little bit too quickly. Um, you know, you think a lot of the XP practices, it takes quite a lot of discipline to get them in place before you start playing around with them yourself, perhaps. Yeah. Things like the Scrum framework and getting into a rhythm and, and that... that that habit of continuous improvement, that habit of continuous collaboration. Yeah. Um, and so the, the dogma has been helpful for some people in the past. Mm -hmm. A little bit like me going to a personal trainer. You know, there'll be times when I just slack off a bit, but if I've got a personal yeah. trainer, they won't let me slack off. And I've bought into that. Sure, hurry, come to mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I wonder, do you see there, there being a downside to that slight more pragmatic approach? Yeah, I think I think it ties in a lot to experience. Um, if I, if I'm in a context where most people don't have experience with Agile, then it's useful to do stuff by the book for a while. But I think maybe at least the companies around here, most people have used Scrum or bastardized Scrum or something, but they, they have, this stuff is not new. Yeah. Yeah. There's gonna be enough people in the room that ha that know Scrum properly so that they can adapt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I guess in if you're in places where Agile is not as widespread, then it's uh, maybe more useful to uh, take something by the book. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also what I also notice is when people do take stuff by the book, they don't do it. They don't treat it as dogma anyway. It's more like, hey, let's use this recipe as a starting point. Yeah. Just like if I make pancakes yeah. the first time, I'm going to follow the recipe, not because this is the best way to do pancakes, but because it's concrete and I can follow it and it'll kind of work. Yeah. And then I can ditch the recipe after a few times. So basically, not treating the recipe as gospel, I think that that's maybe the the the, the change. Yeah. No, I think I think we have seen so you go back ten probably ten years or so, um, and a lot of that infighting that we used to see between frameworks communities saying our our framework's better than yours, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. But I think now that people, like you said, have an awareness of it's not a shock anymore these these terms, and people generally know a lot more now. It doesn't feel I don't feel like I'm having to force down the the, the message down people's throats because they already know what it tastes like they've, they've seen it and even if they haven't done it in that company they've done it somewhere else or they've seen it somewhere else yeah. so I think a lot people are coming from a different position now that they tend to know more and they can make their own choices um, I find myself now talking about the different choices they can make rather than telling them what they should do yeah which I think is a big difference um, 
I was going to say, so Jeff asked what you, th what you think's changed about the environment, uh, Henrik. Do, do you think you've changed much over the last 20 odd years since you started this, this journey? Uh, de definitely. <laughs> the weird thing is, um, I used to be more certain about things in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like this is the way to do things. And it's, it's really, it's, I know it's a cliche, but it really is true for me that the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Mm. So I really become more, more pragmatic. I can go to a team and I'm pretty sure this is, I have an idea, we should do it this way, but I'm also not sure that's the best idea. So it's really like, I've seen this work in a bunch of times in a similar context to this. So what do you think? But I'm really not convinced. So if someone else in the room says, I don't think that's gonna work because of blah, then I'm really listening to that because I've seen it, that be true in some cases. Uh, but there's also, in, there's some other things I have become more confident about. For example, I've really become confident about like, I guess I've, I've, I've become more clear about what's important than what's not. So, for example, I've noticed that a lot of things seem to boil down to if a team has close contact with their customer, then a lot of other, other things sort themselves out. Mm -hmm. So I guess yeah. I've become more clear on what I emphasize. Like, that's kind of the most important thing. How you do it doesn't really matter, but anything we do to reduce that distance is, is most likely going to be helpful. Yeah. And also things like don't burn out teams somewhat dogmatic at some point such, such as that like if i see a project that is doing a death march and people are marching along just working overtime i'm going to be more likely to just put my foot down and say this has to stop right now mm -hmm. well in the past i wouldn't have had that that confidence really yeah so yeah overall yeah. maybe I'm, i know i'm saying the opposite things here but i've become less confident on many things and much more confident on on some few things but that 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 has an impact right because if people know that you're intellectually humble and and around a lot of things when you actually are certain about something people pay attention a lot more right yes. if yeah if i put my foot down every day then it doesn't matter right yeah but if, but if they're used to me being the guy who asks questions and offers suggestions and then one day i say this has to stop right now this is wrong this is broken then then they're gonna go oh, shit what, what you know then they're gonna listen right yeah <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I find myself really relating to what you said there about being less certain than I was before. And, you know, that that hurts to a large degree. I find myself you know, yearning for those days when I was more confident, when I was more certain about things. And the awareness that I've built up over the years, and it sounds like you're pretty similar, has actually just opened. It hasn't brought any kind of comfort or certainty. It's, it's brought the opposite. It's brought anxiety because of you realize how complex things are and how little you do you can be certain of. I was uh, yearning for those days when I didn't know I didn't know so much. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there, there's one thing, though. Another realization, I guess, for me was now that I am back in the trenches as a coder. Because I've been working like kind of in the trenches for a long time, but mostly as a coach. Hmm. So working very close to teams, in the teams, but I haven't been the guy writing the code in the design. Uh, so most of my coding has been on, on the side on my own hobby projects just to kind of keep that, that, that muscle in trim. But now that I'm working almost full time doing actual design and development and working a team and kind of practicing the stuff I've been talking about for all these years, I've noticed my confidence go up also because I, I, I guess I didn't realize how much I was guessing before as a coach. Right. You're, you're trying to help a team solve a problem, but is it their most important problem? Mm. You're suggesting something. Is it a good suggestion? You're kind of guessing. And I find that the, the longer time I worked as a coach and not doing development, the more kind of on thin ice I was. And I would realize sometimes after the fact that this thing that I said was really important was actually the wrong thing for this team. Yeah. And they were just listening and smiling and nodding and waiting for me to leave so they can go back to doing what they needed to do. And so I always had this nagging doubt, like as a coach, the stuff I'm saying now, is it really the most important thing? Or are they just listening because they paid me to come there and talk, right? Yeah. So but now, I, now as a developer in the team building and shipping stuff every week, I'm, I'm a lot more certain in terms of this is a problem we need to solve. Here are some ideas. We can try this. This works. This doesn't. It all comes from a from a from a personal kind of like I got my hands in the jar perspective. So were you were you predominantly a more of a technical coach then rather than an agile coach? Well, it is I guess both um, in, in a sense. But let's say uh, um, we're talking about like the importance so like whether we should do branching or not or mm -hmm. feature toggles that's i guess kind of technical coaching mm -hmm. but then also some other things yeah. like when should we do mob programming when should we do pair programming when should we work independently uh, how long lived branches make sense um or things or organizational things like when does it make sense to work in a true cross-functional team when does it make sense to create more component teams all those kind of things are a lot easier for me to reason and reason around when i'm in the teams because then i can see that okay 
in theory, this would be a place where we where we do standard agile practice A. But in practice, that's now the wrong thing to do. As a coach, I wouldn't be quite as sure. <laughs> yeah. So you, Henrik, are you doing both at the moment? Would you say are you would you yeah. say as a percentage are you one hundred percent developing, or are you still saving a bit of coach, you know, time for coaching and for that organizational role? On, on average, I would say it's about fifty fifty. Okay. So I work almost full time in the in the team, and on average, fifty fifty development coaching, but it's very unevenly distributed over time. So it might be three months of almost only coding and design. Okay. And then suddenly we need to do a major pivot in our roadmap and everything's changing and we just hired a bunch of people. So now I basically put on the coach hat yeah. and I got to help sort things out. So then I may be just doing 20% design coding and really mostly coaching. So it varies over time. Because this, this is a question that does come up quite a lot in even now in my CSM classes and where it always comes up. I'm not going to say quite a lot. It always comes up is that can a scrum master also be a developer? Can they, can they, can they split the role? Can they, What's, what's your opinion on that? I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. I actually like the combination. I find it's useful when there's some people that are both coach and, and team members, because then you have a very hands-on perspective on things. You like everything you do is grounded in reality, but you sometimes lose the whole picture if you're too deep inside the trenches. So it's also useful to have some people that are pure coaches and those two people complement each other perfectly. So I have a colleague, Yasal now, who works at, at Mojang as well, and she's a pure coach doing the kind of stuff I might have, might have been doing in the past. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm in the teams and we complement each other, I think, because she sees things that I don't see and I see things she doesn't see. So we help each other. That's nice. Yeah, almost like an extra, oh well, yeah, like a two, two coaches working together to, yeah. you know, to try so and- Yeah, so, so often in the past when I would come in in a pure coach role, I would make a habit of finding someone who is in the team as a, as a team member and a coach, whether it's a formal or informal coach but a person who has that perspective and I would kind of bond with them because mm -hmm. they would be my insider to keep me real, so to yeah. speak. <laughs> yeah. So you think yeah. you found, eventually you found your calling, the, the, the development is really what you enjoy. Is that is that going to be your career going forward, do you think? It's, it's hard to say because like fi five years ago, I was so into process stuff. I was reading books on lean and agile systems thinking. It was like, it was just what I was really interested in. And now I'm not as interested in it. To me, that's more a means to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm more interested in the product and the coding and the, and the design. Of course, as part of that, I'm also interested in the design process. How do we ship features in a good way? So there's a bit of process stuff, but it's very much anchored in the, in the product itself. So since I've changed in the past, it might change again. So maybe in the future, there'll be something else that'll be my main passion. But right now, it's um, building the product. That, that's what I'm mostly interested in. Cool. Mm. Cool. Where do you think... Um... Where do you think things are going to go in general over the next few years? It's, it's, there's a lot of unknowns out there right now, isn't there? What's going to happen as, as the pandemic evolves and maybe subsides? Well, I, I guess the big interesting thing is this global experiment going on with remote working. Mm -hmm. This global uh, um, unwilling experiment that we're all being guinea pigs. <laughs> right? and, um, and companies are being forced to learn to do things that they previously thought was impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, like my, my team, we were we were so co-located. We were that was everything was around being co-located in the same room, and then from one day to the next, we're all at home, mm -hmm. and we made it work. I can't. I still think it works better to be in the same room, but we found ways. We found things that we could do now that we can't do physically together in the same room. So we're now starting to not only try to match what we did before, but in some senses ex exceed what we did before. And all the so many companies are going through the same journey. So. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens when we get out of the false assumption that agile means having to be in the same room. Mm. Do you think, think you would go back though to being in the same room? I don't think so. I think uh, almost every company I've talked to now, including my own teams, are saying that being in the same room has advantages, being distributed also has advantages, and we're going to try to get the best of both. Mm. But basically, hybrid workplace, I think, is going to be the norm, probably. Um, and hybrid as in... like. There's going to be some days per week when we're all in the same room to do the things that are best to do in the same room. And some days per week when everyone's at home to do the things that are best to do in that context. Yeah. Um, and, and, and infrastructure optimized for dealing with the fact that now somebody is in another country. And instead of that being an odd, weird thing, it's like, yeah, we, we, we have systems for it. We have ways of working for it. Yeah. I, from my experience, it's almost been a new, almost formal now part of an iteration plan, which is... Yeah. When, we, when we're planning this iteration, 
let's work out which bits are going to be synchronous, which bits are going to be asynchronous. Let's let's coordinate those yeah. now. Um, and whereas before that would have, would probably have been avoided, and and they would have just sort of made it up as they went along and made the best of it. Yeah. But the, but there is one thing which I think concerns me a little bit, although it might sort itself out over time, which is the kind of the unfairness of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Because I'm lucky. I have a I have an office at home. I can close yep. the door. I have a fast internet, right? Yeah. Other people live in a cramped apartment with a screaming baby and they have to sit on their kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for them to focus on anything, especially being in a meeting. So you get these people with very different life situations, which means that there's a lot of people that are super depressed mm -hmm. just because they're unlucky. They can't work effectively at home and they're forced to. Mm -hmm. So what I hope is going to happen is if, if this becomes more of a norm, well, A, people might start optimizing their homes to a certain extent if they can. But also maybe there's going to be um, you know more commonly forming hubs of like work hubs where you can go to in your neighborhood mm -hmm. to go to something like an office, um, but not having to be at the office, same as everyone else. Um, those kind of co-working spaces. I'm just guessing that that's going to become more more of a thing for people that either don't want to or really can't work effectively at home. I'm, I'm expecting Sweden to be leading the way on that, as they are with most of these things. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, I was going to mention something else then, but it's gone. It was gone. It'll come back to me in a minute. Carry on. No. Um, <laughs> so, anything else that's going on for you at the moment? What's what apart from the coding side of things? Um, not much. Well, four kids all becoming teenagers, so that's you know a handful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, coaching them, supporting them in their kind of journey. Um, but uh, um, yeah, no. Other than other than that, I think uh, I'm 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 learning a lot. And uh, I really enjoy that. Just the whole, you know, design process thing. I think it's very interesting. How do we ship features in this mm -hmm. game? Uh, well, plus, it's good. really fun to have to get to live this uh, vision that I've been trying to promote for so long. I've, I've seen a few teams live the Agile way. Yeah. And it's so fun to see how inspiring that is. And now I can taste it myself. Being a team, shipping every week, getting feedback from real users, adapting to it, shipping a new version the next week. And it's really exhilarating. So I feel more and more than ever inspired to spread this stuff. I want others to taste that, mm. that, 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 you know, feeling. Yeah. Talking of, um, talking of your kids, oh, I think one thing that often comes up in conversation with my friends is, you know, would you encourage your kids to, to, to follow your path and, you know, do the job that you do? And I know we've joked earlier, earlier on that your kids look at your job and think this is amazing. Would you, what sort of general high level advice would you give them around careers based on your experience? Well, there's this very simplistic kind of mantra that has come be, kind of become a bit of a mantra for me when it comes to life. And I know not everyone has the opportunity, but but the, but the mantra kind of is f find out what it is you love to do and then do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it kind of really boils down to that. And there's this really lovely model called the uh, um, Ikigai from Japan. Ikigai, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly the back, but you maybe have seen it. There's four, yeah. It's a it's a Venn diagram of four circles, right? Perfect. So there's the, what the world needs. There is what you enjoy doing. There's what you can earn a living off of. And then there is what you're good at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I tend to de-emphasize what you're good at because if you enjoy doing something, you, you tend to get good at it. Yeah. But, but the other three circles, right? The world needs it. You can earn a living off it. You enjoy doing it. And just try stuff. So I guess that's what I encourage my kids to do. Tr try things and fi find what, what, what gives you that sense of joy. A and then hopefully you'll find a way to earn a living, 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 living off of it. Um, well, that's really interesting from my perspective because this is quite a circular thing for me because one of the first things you said was – when you were talking about your career is that you, know, you, you said yes a lot and you said yeah. yes a lot more than yes saying no which it's quite ironic in a way because a lot of the time we're, we're, we're telling people in our organizations we're telling our product owners we're telling our developers say no more do less stuff and you get more stuff done right so don't split yeah. your focus too much but actually that's a great way of, of finding out if you don't know what you want to do in life and most kids don't to be fair i still don't yeah. how, then, how, how could you know right how yeah. do you find out unless you try stuff yeah and yeah so that trying, I think saying yes a lot of the time, I think is a really, is a really it's something that I've tried to, as yeah. sort of general thing for my kids is just try loads of things. Yeah, and also also I've emphasized to them that I did not plan this career. I couldn't have planned it. No. Uh, I just followed my nose. If I found something interesting, I would try it, and, and just try to encourage them get get, get your basic education in place because that yeah. opens doors. Mm. 
So, so th th and they've, they've accepted that. They bought that. That's good. So just get the basic education place. So just because it opens more, 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 more doors for you. But then after that, yeah, tr try stuff. And, and you don't need to decide. You don't need to make a career choice because you're very unlikely to keep doing your first job. Yeah. You're probably going to, because almost all, everyone I know works on something that's not what their first job was. Yeah. And it's not what they were educated for. So it's kind of like, don't worry, uh, try something. And then if you don't like it, try something else. And then probably, hopefully, at some point, you'll stumble on, stumble on something that makes you really happy and then try to find a way to make a living off of that, whatever it is, you know, baking or fishing or coding or w whatever it is. Yeah. I guess, and also, in, in my case, there was also another aspect to it. I, 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 wanted, to be, I wanted to become a musician initially. Okay. So when I, when I was at, uh, in, in high school, I was playing music a lot, and I still play music a lot and jamming and you know playing instruments. And, and, my, and my assumption was I'm going to become a musician because that, that's what I like to do. But then when I finished high school, I came to the conclusion that it's probably going to be hard to make a living off of being a musician. Mm. And I might end up having to make music that I don't like making. And then I might it might lose the magic. Yeah. So I got worried about yeah. that. So I started thinking about, can I do something else instead that's more a surefire way of making a living, at least for starters, and then play music just for fun? Because then I don't need to make a living off music. I can do it just for fun. So that's when I decided that coding is something I also like to do. And I'm more likely to be able to make a living off of it, at least initially. So that's 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 why I decided to study, you know, software engineering. And I'm really glad I made that decision because I know so many musician friends that are kind of like, some are doing okay, but many are struggling. They're like, they take whatever gigs they can get. They have to say yes to everything because yeah. they don't get so many requests. Yeah. And they're okay. They're not unhappy, but it wasn't really what it was cut out to be. And I feel very lucky because I can say no to a gig, even though it's well paid. And I can say yes to a gig that's not well paid just because it's more fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm really happy about. It. So I guess the I guess my learning was if 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 I want to do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that has to be my main source of income. Yeah, and we'll gloss over the fact that that Spotify had a role to play in musicians not earning anything anymore. <laughs> 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 yeah, royalties aren't what they used to be. Cool. But, um, um, one final thing, um, Henrik, because I know I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, Two, well, two things. One, one's related to what you, you've got it's back into creep. development now. Sorry, sorry. Well, one that's got you've got back into development. Did you find that hard? So, because I was, I used to be a developer, and I've, I suppose, I've more or less told myself now, oh, you know, this is it's a young person's game. I, you know, I, 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 yeah. I wouldn't be able to keep up. Did you find that tough to get back into it? I was a little bit worried about it because although I had been coding on the side, it was mostly just me and my pet projects. So it wasn't. I didn't really feel cutting edge in that sense. And I felt in intimidated by the mega big brains of everyone on the, on yeah. the team. Yeah. So there was a, a pretty big imposter syndrome in the back of my head. <laughs> so, but when I started joining the team as a coder, it was kind of like as a side thing. I was coaching, but then I had time, I had space in between my in my schedule. Yeah. And I offered to just help out because I noticed they were struggling and they had lots of work to do. So I was like, maybe I can just help fix bugs or something. And, and when I and so I did I did simple things, but when I when I did simple things, I noticed that uh, I was able to contribute more than I thought. I realized that, you know, the actual the actual chops, the skills, the little details, that came back quite quickly. Did it? Okay. Because I had a long enough experience of the architecture of how do you think with around code. Mm. Well, I could I could lean on that, and then the actual you know uh, uh, techniques came back fairly quickly. It also helped that we were using a pretty old version of Java, so you know, <laughs> it was pretty much what it was when I left it, right? So I, I didn't have to learn a bunch of new stuff. Being recorded. Now we just Maybe, maybe I can get back into <laughs> dust yeah. off my old Java. Leave meeting. Java <laughs> Java <laughs> Although just the other week we upgraded to Java 16, yeah. so I'm like, oh shit, okay, I got a look. <laughs> meeting. But, but the, the, so I kind of quickly Probably escalated from being a guy that fixes yeah. bugs to being a guy that now is. You know, responsible for some of the core features of the game and building yeah, it from scratch. And uh, I was like, I shit, how did this happen? Uh, but I guess it's kind of like um, getting into it. There was a bit of a ramp up, but it was yeah. a lot faster than I, than I thought because I had experience. I just oh. needed to freshen up a little bit. So. And my oh, final, right. my final question, was, Henrik. Um, was, it's not from me. It's from my, from my nine-year-old Paul? son. I Is there anything you can, you can, any, any, we've certainly had. Any uh, surprises he can expect again, in kind of future or versions or the next version of Minecraft? Anything that, yeah, any Easter eggs years, that he can look forward to, now, to finding out about? Well, anything well, little well, teasers maybe you can, now, without everything giving too much away? Everything seems to have stopped. Well, we, we, we've, we've learned the hard way not to make anything that can yeah, be interpreted as a promise. Uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, but we are working on, but we already have announced the update we're working on right now, which is called Caves and Cliffs. And I can say that your son is going to be pretty surprised when he fires that up towards the end of the year. When that gets Excellent. shipped, because it changes a lot about yes. the world. 
And it is it. raining um, here right now. In, in so I think he'll enjoy it. Raining, so that's going to make his day. Been, Just those two words, Cajun like, Cliffs, are going to make his day. So I don't yeah. blame yeah. you. I don't blame. Beautiful blue sky. Cool. Great. You, Thank you for hanging yeah. Nice. Lovely to speak to you, my friend. Lovely to, to see you again after all this time. Yeah. It's great. Absolutely. It's great to catch up. Well, maybe. Maybe you'll be tempted out of your your development cave and cliff to uh, to come to a conference or gathering one day when things start traveling again and maybe our paths will cross again and if do we'll, we'll have yeah, a proper beer I, I, I hope so i hope so <laughs> that'd be great but for now we really appreciate your time and not just today but everything that you've done over okay. the years for for what the agile and lean community so cheers thanks to you. thanks cheers, a lot Love to see you again. bye It's quite a refreshing drink, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I've got, um, it, as a tribute to you, Henrik, I've gone for a Swedish cider. Now, these are very big in the UK, which is Copperberg. Okay, what kind of cider? So this is, uh, it's alcohol free. Uh, apple I'm, I'm cider? Free. No, yeah, apple, looks like apples. Or... It is apple apple and raspberry it's kind of a mixed fruit Ooh. edition it's a uh, copperberg made in sweden i feel, um, I feel very bland now. i'm gonna go get a coke zero because that's about all i got at home <laughs> <laughs> but is is copperberg a, a thing in sweden henry oh, yeah, or not yeah, it is it is uh, that, that that's actually a good question i, I don't know really uh, how proud we are of it but <laughs> but it, it is a, it is a pretty big thing i think Yeah, exactly. What? Yeah, that's Swedish as well, isn't it? I think, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. It was it was an article that kind of went out of control, um, <laughs> and then ended up on Lean Pub, I guess. Yeah, definitely. It was not planned. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I have I have four kids, so there was always one or two that were interested in joining on the trip. So I would, they would kind of take turns. Uh, yeah, sometimes when like when I when I was traveling, I would bring like it's actually. It, they, was, they thought it was quite fun being in classroom settings, actually, it's because there's there's whiteboards and there's pens and there's flip charts and stickies and <laughs> lots of snacks and so. I, I bet they're like, Dad, is this really your work? Are you getting paid for this? <laughs> More or less, yeah. Uh, I did some work on climate change. Um, and I guess I did a bit of a pivot, like back into now I'm back into into coding and design. So it's been a, been a bit, bit of back and forth, but I guess if there are some highlights in terms of stuff being known, I guess there's probably those are probably the main ones. Yeah. You... <laughs> when I, I, yeah, so my son, I've got a, a nine-year-old son, Henrik, and um, 
he was beside himself when I was telling that t telling him that I'd be speaking to someone who works with Minecraft, who works at the company that, that <laughs> um, g generates the Minecraft game. And he gave me, he must have reeled off about six or seven questions. I said, well, what, what would you ask someone like that, Owen, if you, if you could speak to him? And, he, and, he just, and it, then he went to some, some kind of different language that I just didn't understand of all these different Minecraft-based questions, yeah. Um, and he was so excitable. But you said, because you said about your kids and, and you must, because you've worked at Lego as well, right? Yeah. And so, but you've your kids must be must think you have the coolest job in the world, surely. Uh, yeah, they're kind of like, how am I gonna? I want I want a job like that when I grow up. How do I do that? <laughs> they're they're kind of pre prematurely jealous. Yeah. <laughs> and how, how how? Yeah, I think we all do. Yeah. How how did you get get stumble into those positions? And I know you're still very much a coach consultant, but how did you, you know, happen across those companies? Yeah, it's it's a bit weird um i guess there was one period just before spotify when i realized that i was just being tugged around in different directions yeah because it's always easier to say yes than no um so i realized i was traveling around a lot doing you know various consulting gigs and talks which i enjoyed but i felt completely unfocused and then i did this kind of self-coaching thing where i started listing down what would be my ideal work situation ideal client and i wrote down like a kind of vision like this is what i would like to do and then to my surprise, I realized that if that client calls me today, I'm going to have to say no because I won't have capacity for it, yeah. which would be stupid. So that's when I decided to kind of take a break and you know clear my calendar a little bit and try to be a little bit more deliberate about what I spent time doing. So, so I took a break. I spent, went traveling six, six months with my, with my family um, and then came back kind of fresh with an empty calendar. And, that, and that's when I contacted Spotify because I'd worked a little bit with them in the past. Um, but then I was like, actually, Spotify kind of ticked all the boxes in terms of what I want to do. Yeah. So I basically just did, uh, you know, my, my first and last cold call, sales cold call. I hate sales. It's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> but I kind of call, called a, a guy that I, that, that I knew there, one of the middle managers, and basically said, hey, you know, you, you guys have growth pain, right? And he's like, yeah. And I said, do you want help with that? And he said, mm -hmm. yes. And then we had lunch, and it was done. So really? that was pretty much kind of what happened and then and then I got stuck there because it was just I was learning so much and they needed help and um, and, and they grew and yeah so I was there for, for, for quite a long time but then l later on when I kind of felt the need to move on then I guess uh, Lego contacted me because some of those people had seen my books and stuff on Spotify yes uh, and then I was kind of like Lego I can't say no to Lego my kids would <laughs> Like <laughs> they disown you, wouldn't they? <laughs> uh, so I had to go to Denmark on a regular basis, um, and it was really interesting. Um, but then, uh, and then I had a climate panic attack at at some point. Realized that shit, the climate is going to hell. The climate is going to hell. Is there anything I can do? So I started, you know, becoming a climate nerd and climate entrepreneur, starting companies and spreading knowledge and making videos. Just like, hey guys, we gotta, you know, <laughs> we we need this atmosphere, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Not, not much of a future without it. So I did that for a while. And then I, I was planning to continue with that. But then I kind of stumbled into Mojang because I had a colleague work, working there. And I realized after a while that although I, I climate change is the most important problem in the world, I felt that I, it wasn't my calling to work with. Um, it was I was torn between what I should do and what I want to do. And what I, what I wanted to do was just, well, actually code Minecraft. I, I stumbled into the team there and started helping them with stuff. And finally, I was like, hey, Shit, I'm doing design and coding now. Now I'm apparently part of this design team, and this is fun. This is what I want to do. <laughs> so it became this kind of realization that what I actually want to do is not primarily coaching and doing talks, although I like that, you know, to a limited extent. Yeah. What I actually like to do is build stuff, and work in teams, and have my hands in the code, and you yeah. know, design. That's actually my calling in life. I kind of realized a bit late. So that's yeah. So I kind of oriented my life around around doing that. So I still do coaching and stuff, but but. Mostly in the context of my current engagement, like coaching the teams around me and the leaders around me. Yeah. And a few, a few things outside. Yeah. And I think no, um, that's the, when me and Jeff were talking about the various people that we wanted to speak to as part of these, Henrik. When your name came up, <coughs> those, the words that resonated with me, with, with you, were, were that you're actually doing it. And you are still very much at the coalface in terms of a lot of um, the agile talks and the, the videos, the content that you produce is all it's high integrity stuff because you're doing it. You're actually living and breathing development on a daily yeah, basis. Just, just sharing, sharing personal experiences, basically. Yeah. 
and exa- I think that's exactly what um, we still need to hear those those compelling stories and 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 to motivate people towards doing this on a better on a day by day basis. But um, to go back to this, you said man, you back all the way back to Spotify. I had a brief look at your LinkedIn profile, and you, and you you quote you've you've written yourself. You think you've accidentally created it. Uh, the, the Spotify model or co-created the, the Spotify yeah. model. Can you talk talk to us about how that came about? It was a, it was the weirdest thing ever. Um, I was there for a few, for like uh, quite a few years actually, but after maybe two or three years there, I was like, this is interesting. This is an interesting company. It's different from other companies I've been at. And we were growing quite quickly. And I realized that the culture seems to be, there's something magical here and it, it can easily be lost as new people come pouring in. So I, so I started becoming the guy that would, you know, introduce new newcomers to what is Spotify about? What is what are we trying to be? Um, and uh, then at some point, uh, I was going to do a talk at a conference in Paris, I think. And, and then I, I, I suggested that as a topic because I thought there's things here we can learn. So I did this keynote in Paris and it went completely viral. Everyone was talking about, I don't think they use the term Spotify model at the time, but I just noticed that people were ex- extremely engaged in it. So I realized, yeah, oh, it's yeah. not its not just me. There's others who think there's interesting stuff happening here. Um, and I started getting a lot of requests to do more talks around it, but also internally a lot of more, more requests. So finally, someone suggested that, hey, maybe you should make a video instead of just you talking all the time. You know, make it, it'll scale better if you just put it, put it down in a video. So, so I did that. I made a video out of it. I figured that, great, now I can just put out the video and I don't have to re- keep to redoing the talk. <laughs> which of course had the exact opposite effect. But what I didn't expect was when I put that video out there, I, I didn't expect it to become a, like a, a model, which you know hundreds of companies would use as their kind of framework. That was a big surprise. So how big was Spotify at that kind of time when you were just starting those those talks? Um, probably maybe I would guess two three hundred people or something like that. Okay. So this is pretty much at the start of their journey then? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a startup. So when it started, they were just a, you know, a, a small group in a basement, basically. But but when I started working with Spotify, I think maybe there were 30, 40 people. Oh, okay. And then when I started working more almost full time, or at least, yeah, um, like more regularly, then maybe there were, you know, 200 or so. Uh, and, that, and that's when I noticed that this, there's something here that I want to capture. There's something interesting happening here. Um, for me, it's mostly, I think, curiosity. Um, I don't have any frustration anywhere, actually. Uh, I know that some other people are kind of like, hey, you shouldn't just copy a model and blah, blah. But my experience is, is that people copy models all the time, copy other companies and learn from it and improve. And that's kind of the way things work. Uh, most of the ideas that we applied at Spotify weren't invented at Spotify. That was just us looking around and stealing the best ideas from everywhere. So I think that's both natural and even good to copy from each other. Um, the most important thing is, of course, to adapt. You can't just copy and then not adapt. But I don't. I haven't seen anybody just copy any model and not adapt. You, you kind of automatically have to do that. So I'm really not uh, worried about it. Um, and I find that I've met a lot of companies who uh, apply what they think of as a Spotify model. And what I've observed is that in most places, in most cases, they end up in a better place than they were before. They don't end up, you know, doing the same thing as we did. And that what probably wasn't even appropriate. But they got inspired. They 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 they, they took some ideas. Uh, and imp- implemented their interpretation of our ideas or sometimes even their misinterpretation of our ideas. And it doesn't matter. Uh, they got inspired to change and they changed. Uh, so that's fine. Um, and it also seems like there's a lot more to win than to lose because I haven't seen a single case firsthand where things got worse. Mm. Um, so that's why I'm not really worried about it. I'll just say, go ahead, you know, co- copy, paste and adapt from all over the place. Yeah, then I'd be more worried. I'd be like, what the heck? Why? I'm not responsible for how what where you end up like. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. Um, in the beginning, when it first was released, um, that was the time when it was most accurate, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and uh, or like the, like the, the video at the time was pretty close to reality, and then of course over time the video stays and reality can, changes, right? So 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 the the, the correctness of the, of the video de degrades over time, but at the time when it was released, most people were like me; they were just very surprised because they're like, "What? Why is everyone talking about something called the Spotify model? What is that?" <laughs> Someone says, that, "That that that's what you guys are doing. What? I've never heard of it." <laughs> and then someone points at the video. Oh, that. Oh, was, oh, that's a model now. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, but then I, and, and, but mostly people were very happy because um, the most common comment internally was uh, um, spot on. Like this nail is what we are or trying to be. And then that became a really useful recruiting tool because a lot of people saw this video, came to Spotify already primed. So yeah. we didn't have to explain what we want to be. They already came knowing that. But of course, you know, five years later, people would watch a video and coming expecting to see that, and then they'd be very surprised that it's, things are different. So in that sense, I guess it kind of became frustrating. They had to explain that this video was a snapshot in time for a company that was 10 times smaller. <laughs> mm. And are you still working with them now, Henrik, or not? Um, no, I'm, I'm almost full-time at, at Mojang now. Okay. Um, similarity, I guess, is a very experimental mindset and a very pragmatic approach to agile, you know, very little buzzwords and dogma. Mm. Um, and a, an extreme passion for the product, I think, is a, is, a, is a common denominator. Also at Lego, people just care a lot, um, which makes things both easier and harder sometimes. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. I worked with some banks before and things like that. It's a little harder sometimes to find the same level of engagement. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. But uh, so that's, I guess, a common denominator. But there are some differences too, I guess. Um, um, so I guess the scale is a difference. Spotify was just so much bigger. The, the Minecraft team is quite small, very small in comparison. Um, although Mojang is a bigger company, but I work mostly with the Minecraft folks. Um, I guess another difference is that um, um, at, at Spotify, there was also more things happening. There was hardware. There was like partnerships and integrations like it was a more complex ecosystem in a sense My, minecraft is more of a coherent product this is the code base that's it uh, spotify was a, was a more like a you know um microservice architecture with a thousand you know hundreds of different systems and interact in different complex ways plus that spotify was very much around operations it's a system that's running people need to press, press play and music needs to start uh minecraft sure we do run servers but mainly it's a product that we ship and people download and run on their own host their own servers mm. so we're not as much you know like having to host and, and do that kind of stuff. So g going back a bit further, uh, Henrik, back to kind of, well, pre, almost pre um, Scrum and Agile, that kind of the, the movement first started. How did you first get involved with kind of software development and how did you that steer you towards ag Agile as a, as a wider concept? I, I guess like most things, that was also accidental. Um, <laughs> but when I started as a software engineer, um, I was a consultant. It was, this was during the dot-com era. So any okay. person halfway through college was considered an expert and would be paid large amounts of money to consult or contract to type, write code, even though we're all beginners. <laughs> Crazy period. So there I was, consulting, contracting, writing code. Um, but I was kind of surprised because I, I, I'd be sitting there in my, in, my, in my cubicle, you know, typing code and then part-time as I was also studying. And I noticed that, you know, I didn't even know who the customer was. I didn't know, didn't know who else was working on this thing or how my stuff was supposed to fit together with anyone else's. And it became this pattern of, it almost felt like I was in, you know, like a matrix moment. What is this weird parallel universe where people are just working and nothing fits together? Is this really the way it's supposed to be? So I was almost kind of disillusioned. Like, is this really, you know, the way it's supposed to work? Do I really want to be in this business? Like, it just, <laughs> so I just saw so many f big failures. Uh, but then later on, a, a friend pulled me into a startup, and it was just f us four starting a company. And it, you know, and I, so suddenly I was writing code for myself, and I was hiring people, and I was building teams, and I was like, "Shit! Uh, n now I need to make this work. Uh, now I got a bunch of people, and I need some way of working. And uh, I don't want it to be like all these failed projects I've seen. So it's like I knew exactly how to fail, but not really how to succeed." Um, so I was like basically desperately looking around for, you know, there must be some IT projects that succeeded somewhere that I can learn from. <laughs> and I started kind of desperately Googling around and I ended up at this C2 or C3 wiki, what's it called? Uh, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham and company. Okay, yeah. 
uh, their initial, the first wiki basically, because Ward Cunningham invented wikis. That's right, that, yeah. That we forget the, that. We that do forget that, wiki. yeah. Um, and then uh, that, well, that was just, it's still up. You can still find it. It's full of wisdom. They're basically yeah. sharing knowledge. So things like pair programming, test driven development, you know, self organizing teams, all that before Agile came along as a concept. That's the kind of embryo. That yeah, so I was yeah, I was in the I think I was ninety nine or something like that. I was I was uh, using that site to learn, uh, maybe two thousand. And uh, I started applying what was on the site because it seemed to just make sense, and it kind of worked. Like it wasn't like silver bullet, of course, but compared to absolute guaranteed disaster, it was great. Right? We were shipping stuff. We were having fun. Yeah. We were learning and iterating. So I was just like, okay, this seems to be a better approach. So I was basically hooked from day one. Um, and then later on, Agile Manifesto came along and kind of like it became more clear, like, and I, I just stayed with it since then, basically. So, which, yeah. I would say during different periods, it's been different people, but I would say it kind of started with probably Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries and, uh, you know, Ward Cunningham, the XP guys, basically. And then later on, as I started applying this at scale, then I stumbled into Scrum and I started working with, with Jeff Sutherland. And then he became a big source of inspiration, basically because we worked a lot together. And then uh, uh, later on, I got into Lean. I started getting more curious about the whole, you know, why does this work? What, is the, what, is the, what are the principles behind? Which led me to Lean and systems thinking. So then I started working with Mary Poppendick and people like Don Reinertsen and that whole kind of Lean side of things. Um, so it's been different during different periods. Um, basically trying to, you know, learn from as many people as, as I can. And you mentioned, Henrik, so the companies that you've talked about largely, and you're based in Sweden, um, just outside of Stockholm, you, you mentioned, but do you see, is that mainly your clients and, and the companies you've, you've centered around that kind of uh, location geographically? Have you ventured much out uh, into the rest of the well, world? I've been traveling quite a lot to do conferences and courses, but not so much for coaching, basically because I'm lazy. <laughs> and I have kids and family, and I don't want to do engagements where I have to travel regularly. So basically, as long as I could find interesting, you know, clients in, in, in nearby, I would, I would prioritize yeah. them. And I'm mean, lucky. Wanna... Stockholm has been a kind of a bit of a hub for uh, interesting companies. Well, um, that's the thing, because uh, Scandinavia certainly, as um, certainly from looking from here from the UK, we've we've looked at uh, Scandinavia as kind of a very much a hotbed of, of agile in terms of early adoption and kind of a lot of companies that have, have really taken to it. Do you do you think that's um have you noticed that with scandinavian scandinavian companies as well Def definitely and I, and I think there's a bit of a cultural bias that's helped us because a lot of these values in agile such as the self-organization and stuff kind of fits with swedish culture okay i think maybe i'm just guessing but maybe that's why there's a little maybe a little bit of less resistance since people kind of tend to want to work this way anyway yeah that's part of it but otherwise i don't know there's always been a lot of you know, companies starting around here, um, like a pretty entrepreneur friendly culture. I'm not sure why. Maybe part of it is also our, our social security system, where if you would decide to start a company, you're not risking your livelihood. Um, so it's like a limited liability thing um, and uh, kind of insurance. You're, 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 you're not going to be homeless and hungry if you fail, basically. Mm. Yeah. I think that makes people, gives people a bit of courage to, to try things. Plus, I think the, the free education, anyone can go to un university. And at universities, without paying, so so that so so that mean and there that's where people meet each other and get ideas and want to try new ideas. So I think maybe just the fact that there's so many people that have the economic opportunity to try crazy ideas means that there's statistically likely that some are gonna some are gonna succeed. Yeah, it's definitely that I get that. Um, we hear a lot in the news about again the social security system, particularly in Sweden, about how people um, generally happier and kind of they feel a lot more. I think it's a lot to do with psychological safety as well. People feel. Yeah. Like they, they, like you say, try things out. They can perhaps change their job or they can uh, start a new company or, or come up with a new idea without a fear of failure. Without, yeah. without, you and know, I guess the, the downside is if you do succeed and you, you know, your company does well and you get rich, you're going to be taxed a lot for it. Exactly, yeah. You're not going to yeah. get as filthy rich as you might have been somewhere else. Yeah, uh, but yeah, but you, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> would you rather pay high taxes and have you know, an increased social security? Maybe that, that's the thing. That's, a, that's yeah. a cultural difference. Yeah, I find but, that once you, you know, when it comes to like, once you get past a certain level of earning money, I think in most cases that extra doesn't matter so much. Mm. When you have your basic security and you can do what you want to do, then it's the rest is maybe just... I know that some people are very driven by earning as much money as possible, but I think it maybe just becomes a game a a after some point. Yeah. Uh, so most of the people that I work with 
you know, entrepreneurs, they're not driven by, I'm going to get rich. It's more like, I want to do this thing. I want to change the music industry. Uh, I want to make a wonderful game. And then the, the money is more like the rocket fuel. You need fuel for the rocket to go, but the fuel isn't the goal itself um, kind of thing. Depends on what time of year you come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but that, that, that's true. There, there are, from, from what I've seen also statistically, I mean, n not at the top, of course, but definitely it seems to be kind of above average, generally, general well-being. Um, yeah. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're super depressed and super worried about how you're going to pay this month's bill, you're not going to be likely to start the next Spotify kind of thing. Yeah, true. How you said, um, Henry, you like traveling. How has this last uh, eighteen months affected your travel schedule? Uh, other than just um, no travel at all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How, how have you been coping with that? I have this. Uh, I have this dilemma because I like traveling, but I also don't like climate change. Yes. And flying is a problem. Mm. So at some point, I realized I can't sit on a plane anymore without feeling like sh like shit. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I minimized that radically. Uh, so that was one. So I did travel a little bit, but mostly by train whenever possible. And I went, I would get on a plane sometimes, but just like a last resort. Uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, COVID came along and the last little bit of time I was doing this period of time for a long time. Um, no, I don't really know. I'm kind of still hoping for a, you know, travel more locally. Train, I think, is nice. It just takes time. Um, it's not super reliable. But uh, what I really want is for someone to just invent the damn electric plane. Hurry up, man. Make the electric plane so I can go back to traveling all over the world. It's fun. <laughs> well, everything's possible, isn't it? I mean, there's... Yeah. It, 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 it kind of is. I, I, just, I just don't think I'm going to be the one inventing it. So I'm just going to keep uh, inspiring people, hoping, hoping so much. Well, there's also plenty of people doing it, so... It's just a matter of fanning the flames, right? H hurry up that, that innovation. We're getting some breakup. No, I think it's you. I think it's Henrik. We're getting some... Um your signal's dropping, I think, Henry, Henrik, a bit. Uh, Can you hear us? Uh, yeah. I didn't move to shade. I think my computer's overheating. It's getting angry at me. Yeah, it, was just, it broke up that last few yeah. minutes. There we go. Um, you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the freezing up. I'm like, okay, this computer's overheating. It was in direct sunlight. <laughs> um, I, I think maybe the main trend I've seen is uh, uh, going from dogma to being pragmatic. In the past, it was a lot more like, hey, my framework is better than yours. Or, hey, you need to use this framework by the book, otherwise you're doing it wrong. I don't see a lot of that anymore. Um, and also, there's a lot more uh, Agile is taken for granted kind of thing. Before, you'd have to kind of explain what Agile is, and there'd be a transitioning, and there'd be like almost like a convincing happening where people needed to be sold what Agile is. I don't see that anymore, at least not from my perspective. It's more like people want this. They, they want help with the how. Um, so, I, of course, you know, every, my perspective is, of course, biased by the companies I happen to work with, but at least, the, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that, that trend pretty clearly. What do about you, you think, guys? Well, well yeah. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to my question as I change the subject. Have we changed? Yeah. 
just a pure hurry if not the mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think it ties in a lot to experience. Um, if I, if I'm in a context where most people don't have experience with agile, then it's useful to do stuff by the book for a while. But I think maybe at least the companies around here, most people have used Scrum or bastardized Scrum or something, but they, they have, this stuff is not new. Yeah. There's gonna be enough people in the room that ha that know Scrum properly so that they can adapt. Yeah. Um, but I guess in if you're in places where Agile is not as widespread, then it's uh, maybe more useful to uh, take something by the book. But I think it's also what I also notice is when people do take stuff by the book, they don't do it. They don't treat it as dogma anyway. It's more like, hey, let's use this recipe as a starting point. Just like if I make pancakes yeah. the first time, I'm going to follow the recipe, not because this is the best way to do pancakes, but because it's concrete and I can follow it and it'll kind of work. Yeah. And then I can ditch yeah. the recipe after a few times. So basically, not treating the recipe as gospel, I think that that's maybe the the the, the change. I think we, I think we have seen. So you go back ten, probably ten years, or so, um, and a lot of that infighting that we used to see between frameworks, communities saying our our framework's better than yours. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. But I think now that people, like you said, have an awareness of it's not a shock anymore. These the terms and people generally know a lot more now. It doesn't feel. I don't feel like I'm having to force down the the, the message down people's throats because they already know what it tastes like. They've they've seen it. And even if they haven't done it in that company, they've done it somewhere else or they've seen it somewhere else. Yeah. So I think a lot people are coming from a different position now that they tend to know more and they can make their own choices. Um, I find myself now talking about the different choices they can make rather than telling them what they should do. Yeah. Which I think is a big difference. Um, I was going to say, so Jeff asked what you, th what you think has changed about the environment, uh, Henrik. Do, do you think you've changed much over the last... 20 odd years since you started this this journey uh, de definitely <laughs> the weird thing is um i used to be more certain about things in the past yeah <laughs> like this is the way to do things and then it's, it's really it's i know it's a cliche but it really is true for me that the more i learn the more i realize i don't know so i really become more more pragmatic i can go to a team and i'm pretty sure this is i have an idea we should do it this way but i'm also not sure that's the best idea so it's really like I've seen this work in a bunch of times in a similar context to this. So what do you think? But I'm really not convinced. So if someone else in the room says, I don't think that's going to work because of blah, then I'm really listening to that because I've seen it, that be true in some cases. Uh, but there's also in, there's some other things I have become more confident about. For example, I've really become confident about, like, I guess I've, I've, I've become more clear about what's important than what's not. So for example, I've noticed that a lot of things seems to boil down to if a team has close contact with their customer, then a lot of other, th other things sort themselves out. So I yeah. guess I've become more clear on what I emphasize, like that's kind of the most important thing. How you do it doesn't really matter, but anything we do to reduce that distance is, is most likely going to be helpful. And also things like don't burn out teams. I'm somewhat dogmatic on some points, such, such as that. Like if I see a project that is doing a death march and people are marching along just working overtime, I'm going to be more likely to just put my foot down and say, this has to stop right now. Well, in the past, I wouldn't have had that, that confidence really. So yeah, overall, maybe I'm, I know I'm saying the opposite things here, but I've become less confident on many things and much more confident on, on some few things. Yes. Yeah. If I put my foot down every day, then it doesn't matter. Right. But if they're used to me being the guy who asks questions and offers suggestions, and then one day I say, this has to stop right now. This is wrong. This is broken. Then, then they're going to go, oh, shit. What, what, you know, then they're going to listen, right? Yes. Yeah, th there's one thing though, another I realization, I guess, for me was now that I'm back in the trenches as a coder, 
because I've been working like kind of in the trenches for a long time, but mostly as a coach. So working very close to teams in the teams, but I haven't been the guy writing the code in the design. Uh, so most of my coding has been on, on the side on my own hobby projects, just to kind of keep that, that, that muscle in trim. But now that I'm working almost full time doing actual design and development and working in a team and kind of practicing the stuff I've been talking about for all these years, I've noticed my confidence go up also because I, I, I guess I didn't realize how much I was guessing before as a coach. You're, you're trying to help a team solve a problem, but is it their most important problem? Mm. You're suggesting something. Is it a good suggestion? You're kind of guessing. And I find that the, the longer time I worked as a coach and not doing development, the more kind of on thin ice I was. And I would realize sometimes after the fact that this thing that I said was really important was actually the wrong thing for this team. Yeah. And they were just listening and smiling and nodding and waiting for me to leave so they can go back to doing what they needed to do. And so I always had this nagging doubt, like as a coach, the stuff I'm saying now, is it really the most important thing? Or are they just listening because they paid me to come there and talk, right? Yeah. But now, I, now as a developer in the team, building and shipping stuff every week, I'm, I'm a lot more certain in terms of this is a problem we need to solve. Here are some ideas. We can try this. This works. This doesn't. It all comes from a, from a, from a personal kind of like I got my hands in the jar perspective. Well, it is, I guess, both um, in, in a sense. But let's say uh, um, we're talking about like the importance, or, like whether we should do branching or not, or feature toggles. That's, I guess, kind of technical coaching. Mm -hmm. But then also other things yeah. like when should we do mob programming? When should we do pair programming? When should we work independently? Uh, how long lived branches make sense? Um, or things, or organizational things like when does it make sense to work in a true cross functional team? When does it make sense to create more component teams? All those kind of things are a lot easier for me to reason and reason around when I'm in the teams, because then I can see that okay, in theory, this would be a place where we where we do standard agile practice A, but in practice, that's now the wrong thing to do. As a coach, I wouldn't be quite as sure. <laughs> yeah. So are you, Henrik, are you doing both at the moment? Would you say are you? Would you yeah. say as a percentage, are you 100% developing, or are you still saving a bit of coaching, your time for coaching and for that organizational role? On, on average, I would say it's about 50-50. Okay. So I work almost full time in the in the team, and on average, 50-50 development coaching, but it's very unevenly distributed over time. So it might be three months of almost only coding and design. Okay. And then suddenly we need to do a major pivot in our roadmap, and everything's changing, and we just hired a bunch of people. So then I basically put on the coach hat, yeah. and I got to help sort things out. So then I may be just doing 20% design coding, and really mostly coaching. So it varies over time. Because this, this is a question that does come up quite a lot in even now in my CSM classes, and it, well, it always comes up, I'm not going to say quite a lot, it always comes up, is that can a Scrum Master also be a developer? Can they, can they, can they split the role? Can they, what's, what's your opinion on that? I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. I actually like the combination. I find it's useful when there's some people that are both coach and, and team members, because then you have a very hands-on perspective on things. You're like everything you do is grounded in reality, but you sometimes lose the whole picture if you're too deep inside the trenches. So it's also useful to have some people that are pure coaches and those two people complement each other perfectly. So I have a colleague, Yasal now who works at, at Mojang as well, and she's a pure coach doing the kind of stuff I might've might been doing in the past. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm in the teams and we complement each other, I think, because she sees things that I don't see and I see things she doesn't see. So we help each other. That's nice. Yeah, almost like an extra, well, yeah, like a, Two, two coaches working together to, yeah. to try and... So, yeah. so, so often in the past, when I would come in at a pure coach role, I would make a habit of finding someone who is in the team as a as a team member and a coach, whether it's a formal or informal coach, but a person who has that perspective. And I would kind of bond with them because mm -hmm. they would be my insider to keep me real, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, the It's, it's hard to say because like five, five years ago, I was so into process stuff. I was reading books on lean and agile systems thinking. It was like, it was just what I was really interested in. And now I'm not as interested in it. To me, that's more a means to an end. Uh, so I'm more interested in the product and the coding and the, and the design. Of course, as part of that, I'm also interested in the design process. How do we ship features in a good way? So there's a bit of process stuff, but it's very much anchored in the, in the product itself. So since I've changed in the past, it might change again. So maybe in the future, there'll be something else that'll be my main passion. But right now it's um, building the product. That, that's what I'm mostly interested in. Mm. 
Well, I, I guess the big interesting thing is this global experiment going on with remote working. This global uh, um, unwilling experiment that we're all being guinea pigs, right? And, <laughs> Um, and companies are being forced to learn to do things that they previously thought was impossible, mm. right? Uh, like my, my team, we were we were so co-located. We were that was everything was around being co-located in the same room, and then from one day to the next, we're all at home, and mm. we made it work. I can't. I still think it works better to be in the same room, but we found ways, we found things that we could do now that we can't do physically together in the same room. So we're now starting to not only try to match what we did before, but in some senses ex exceed what we did before. And all the so many companies are going through the same journey. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when we get out of the false assumption that agile means having to be in the same room. Because mm. I think. I don't think so. I think uh, almost every company I've talked to now, including my own teams, are saying that being in the same room has advantages. Being distributed also has advantages. And we're going to try to get the best of both. Mm. But basically, hybrid workplace, I think, is going to be the norm, probably. Um, and hybrid as in like, there's going to be some days per week when we're all in the same room to do the things that are best to do in the same room and some days per week when everyone's at home to do the things that are best to do in that context. Um, and, and, and infrastructure optimized for dealing with the fact that now somebody is in another country. And instead of that being an odd, weird thing, it's like, yeah, we, we, we have systems for it. We have ways of working for it. Yeah, but, the, but there is one thing which I think concerns me a little bit, although it might sort itself out over time, which is the kind of the unfairness of the whole thing, because I'm lucky. I have, a, I have an office at home. I can close the door. I have a fast internet, right? Yeah. Other people live in a cramped apartment with a screaming baby and they have to sit on their kitchen table and it's really hard for them to focus on anything, especially being in a meeting. So we get these people with very different life situations, which means that there's a lot of people that are super depressed just because they're unlucky can't work effectively at home and they're forced to. Mm. So what I hope is going to happen is if, if this becomes more of a norm, well, A, people might start optimizing their homes to a certain extent if they can, but also maybe there's going to be, a, you know, more commonly forming hubs of like work hubs where you can go to in your neighborhood mm. to go to something like an office, um, but not having to be at the office, same as everyone else. Um, those kind of co-working spaces. I'm just guessing that that's going to become more more of a thing for people that either don't want to or really can't work effectively at home. Mm. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to mention something else then, but it's gone. It was gone. It'll come back to me in a minute. Carry on. <laughs> Um, not much. Well, four kids all becoming teenagers. So that's, you know, a handful, <laughs> uh, coaching them, supporting them in their kind of journey. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, no, other than, other than that, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot and uh, I really enjoy that. Just the whole, you know, design process thing. I think it's very interesting. How do we ship features in this game? Uh, plus, it's really fun to have to get to live this uh, vision that I've been trying to promote for so long. I've, I've seen a few teams live the Agile way, and it's so fun to see how inspiring that is. And now I can taste it myself, being a team, shipping every week, getting feedback from real users, adapting to it, shipping a new version the next week. And it's really exhilarating. So I feel more and more than ever inspired to spread this stuff. I want others to taste that, 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 that you know, feeling. There's this very simplistic kind of mantra that has come be, kind of become a bit of a mantra for me when it comes to life. And I know not everyone has the opportunity, but, but the, the mantra kind of is f find out what it is you love to do and then do that. Um, 
and I think it kind of really boils down to that. And there's this really lovely model called the uh, um, Ikigai from Japan. Iki, I don't know exactly the back, but you maybe have seen it. It's for it's a it's a Venn diagram of four circles, right? So there's that what the world needs. There is what you enjoy doing. There's what you can earn a living off of, and then there is what you're good at. Mm. Uh, I tend to de-emphasize the what you're good at because if you enjoy doing something, you, you tend to get good at it. But but the other three circles, right? The world needs it. You can earn a living off it. You enjoy doing it, and just try stuff. So I guess that's what I encourage my kids to do: Tr- try things and find find what 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 gives you that sense of joy, and, and then hopefully you'll find a way to earn a living 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 off of it. Um, Yeah. 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 How how, how could you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also, also, I've emphasized to them that I did not plan this career. I couldn't have planned it. Uh, I just followed my nose. If I found something interesting, I would try it, and, and just try to encourage them get get, get your basic education in place because that yeah. opens doors. Mm. So, so, th- and they've they've accepted that. They bought that. That's good. So, just get the basic education in place. So just because it opens more 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 doors for you. But then after that, yeah, tr- try stuff. And, and you don't need to decide. You don't need to make a career choice because you're very unlikely to keep doing your first job. You're probably going to – because almost all everyone I know works on something that's not what their first job was. Yeah. And it's not what they were educated for. So it's kind of like don't worry. Uh, try something. And then if you don't like it, try something else. And then probably, hopefully, at some point, you'll stumble on, stumble on something that makes you really happy. And then try to find a way to make a living off of that, whatever it is, being baking or fishing or coding or whatever it is. Yeah. I guess, and also in, in my case, there was also another aspect to it. I, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to become a musician initially. So when I when I was at, uh, in in high school, I was playing music a lot, and I still play music a lot, and jamming, and you know, playing instruments. And and my, and my assumption was I'm going to become a musician because that, that's what I like to do. But then when I finished high school. I came to the conclusion that it's probably going to be hard to make a living off of being a musician. Mm. And I might end up having to make music that I don't like making. And then I might, it might lose the magic. So I got worried about that. So I started thinking about, can I do something else instead? That's more a surefire way of making a living, at least for starters, and then play music just for fun. Cause then I don't need to make a living off music. I can do it just for fun. So that's when I decided that coding is something I also like to do. And I'm more likely to be able to make a living off of it, at least initially. So that's, that's, that's why I decided to study, you know, software engineering. And I'm really glad I made that decision because I know so many musician friends that are kind of like, some are doing okay, but many are struggling. They're like, they take whatever gigs they can get. They have to say yes to everything because yeah. they don't get so many requests. Yeah. And they're okay. They're not unhappy, but it wasn't really what it was cut out to be. And I feel very lucky because I can say no to a gig, even though it's well paid. And I can say yes to a gig that's not well paid just because it's more fun. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm really happy about it. So I guess, the, I guess my learning was, if, if, if I want to do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that has to be my main, main source of income. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, royalties aren't what they used to be, are they? But um, um, one final thing, um, Henrik, because I know we're, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, two, well, two things. One, one's related to what you, you've got back into development now. Sorry, sorry. Well, one that's got you've got back into development. Did you find that hard? So, because I was, I used to be a developer, and I've, I suppose, I've more or less told myself now, oh, you know, this is it's a young person's game. I, you know, I, 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 yeah. I wouldn't be able to keep up. Did you find that tough to get back into it? I was a little bit worried about it because although I had been coding on the side, it was mostly just me and my pet projects. So it wasn't. I didn't really feel cutting edge in that sense, and I felt in- intimidated by the mega big brains of everyone on the, on yeah. the team. Yeah. So there was a pretty big imposter syndrome in the back of my head. <laughs> so, but when I started joining the team as a coder, it was kind of like as a side thing. I was coaching, but then I had time. I had space in between my in my schedule. Yeah. And I offered to just help out because I noticed they were struggling and they had lots of work to do. So I was like, maybe I can just help fix bugs or something. And, and when I so I did I did simple things, but when I when I did simple things, I noticed that 
uh, I was able to contribute more than I thought. I realized that, you know, the actual the actual chops, the skills, the little details that came back quite quickly. Did it? Okay. Because I had a long enough experience of the architecture of how do you think with around code. Mm. So I could I could lean on that, and then the actual you know uh, uh, techniques came back fairly quickly. It also helped that we were using a pretty old version of Java, so you know. <laughs> It was pretty much what it was when I left it, right? So I, I didn't have to learn a bunch of new stuff. That's now we just upgraded. Maybe, maybe I can get back into dust off my old Java. Java, it's Java eight. Although just the other week we upgraded to Java sixteen, so I'm like, oh shit, okay, I got a lot. <laughs> but but the, the, so I kind of quickly escalated from being a guy that fixes bugs to being a guy that now is, you know, responsible for some of the core features of the game and building it from scratch. And I was like, That's shit, awesome. how did this happen? But I guess it's kind of like getting into it. There was a bit of a ramp up, but it was yeah. a lot faster than I, than I thought because I had experience. I just needed to freshen up a little bit. So, and my final my final question, Henrik, um, it's not from me. It's from my from my nine year old son. Is there anything you can you can any um any um any surprises he can expect in kind of future versions or the next version of Minecraft? Anything that any Easter eggs that he can look forward to to finding out about? Anything you little teasers? Maybe you can without giving too much away. Well, we, we, we've learned the hard way not to make anything that can be interpreted as a promise. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but we are working on, but we already have announced the update we're working on right now, which is called Caves and Cliffs. Ooh. And I can say that your son is going to be pretty surprised when he fires that up really? towards the end of the year when that gets Excellent. shipped because it changes a lot about the world. Does it? Um, so I think he'll enjoy it. That's going to make his day. Just those two words, Caves and Cliffs, is going to make his day. I'll yeah. look forward to that. Great. Thank you, Henry. Nice, lovely to speak to you, my friend. Lovely to, to see you again Good after thing. all this time. Yeah. It's great Absolutely. It's great, to, great to catch up. We'll see where we bump each other. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks Cheers, a lot. Lovely to see you again. Day. Bye. Cheers.